During the past 10 years, an average of 263 patients has been admitted each year to the burn ward of the United States Army Institute of Surgical Research, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Of this group, over 70% had thermal injury involving the hand, which was of actual or potential functional significance. Severe hand burns may cause immediate loss of function, and infection and immobilization may result in delayed or secondary functional deficit. This film depicts the treatment techniques employed at this institute to minimize hand injury and ensure maximum functional recovery. Initially, pain and edema limit motion and use of the hands. Physical therapy beginning on the day of injury and continuing throughout hospitalization consists of early vigorous exercise, functional activities, and appropriate splinting and positioning to minimize deformities and loss of motion. The characteristic posture of the burned hand is flexion of the wrist, extension or hyperextension of the metacarpophalangeal joints, flexion of the interphalangeal joints, and adduction of the thumb. These joints will become tight and the hand badly deformed if the patient is not continually encouraged to move the hand and fingers. Therefore, the physical therapist initiates and carefully supervises an exercise program designed to aid in regaining extension of the wrist, flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints, and complete abduction of the thumb. This program must include daily evaluation and modification of exercises to achieve the maximum range of motion and to preserve function. This 27-year-old male incurred extensive thermal injury over 41.5% of his total body surface in an aircraft accident. The hand burns were second and third degree. Three days post-burn, he is experiencing difficulty with hand motion and must receive gentle assistance from the physical therapist. We encourage the patient to move his hand and carefully assist him when his active range of motion is incomplete. If there is a suspicion of extensor tendon or extensor hood involvement, the patient is restricted to gentle active motion. Any assistance to motion is absolutely abandoned in these cases. This patient on the third post-burn day receives assistance with his daily hand exercises from the physical therapist. She instructs him regarding the proper hand position during bed rest and the importance of hand elevation to help reduce edema. An important part of the initial treatment of patients with hand burns is to encourage self-care activities. One of the first functional activities the patient attempts is feeding himself, as demonstrated on the sixth post-burn day. Initially, wood blocks are used to increase the size of the utensil for easier grasping. In the early stage of the patient's therapy program, Hand position is important. Here, the occupational therapist applies a fiberglass splint to the patient's left hand to maintain the wrist between neutral and 15 degrees of extension with metacarpophalangeal joints in flexion. These splints are worn only during the patient's sleeping hours, and he is encouraged to use his hand as much as possible while awake. A daily hydrotherapy program is employed for all patients with hand burns. The therapist makes a daily evaluation of the patient's progress in this exercise program. This patient on the 11th post-burn day receives assistance in achieving proper wrist extension, metacarpophalangeal flexion, and thumb opposition and abduction. 
14 days post-burn, the second degree Palmer burn of this patient is healing satisfactorily. And with daily active exercises to tolerance, the patient is maintaining an acceptable range of motion. The edema has subsided, and the eschar on the hands is beginning to separate. On the 32nd post-burn day, this patient had cutaneous xenografts applied to the right hand. Such grafts may be used as a temporary biologic dressing over second-degree burns to help prevent infection, to promote healing, and reduce pain. Application of xenograft or allograft does not preclude a continuing exercise program, so the patient should be encouraged, as before, to work vigorously toward full range of motion. However, this patient is beginning to demonstrate the common problem of limitation of metacarpophalangeal flexion and proximal interphalangeal extension in the fifth finger. Following autografting, all exercise is discontinued for four or five days. Any motion prior to this time might cause dislodgement or loss of the autograft. Four days after autografting, this patient is allowed to begin active hand exercises in the arm tank. Only active exercise is performed at this time to avoid avulsion of the graft. This patient, fitted with a hand splint to prevent motion in the immediate post-graft period, has had a metallic dress hook glued to the nail of the index finger. A rubber band attached to the dress hook further limits motion and also applies some traction to the finger to help prevent a flexion contracture of the proximal interphalangeal joint. Four days post-autograft, the splint is removed temporarily to allow the patient to perform gentle, active exercise. These particular patients all return to duty within two months after injury. All demonstrated good manual dexterity, and none encountered any difficulty in carrying out daily activities. Their course of treatment was followed from the time of admission to the time of discharge in order to demonstrate the progressive stages of healing, the type of exercise program followed in these stages, and the various types of rehabilitative programs that can be used in helping patients with potentially disastrous burns of the hands to return to normal productive lives. At the time of discharge, the patient is instructed in a detailed exercise program to be carried on at home to ensure maintenance of functional capabilities. A burn to the hands can be a most debilitating injury. The treatment and techniques portrayed in this film are one approach to preventing as much deformity and functional loss as possible. The vital elements in this treatment program are early and progressive exercise, elevation of involved extremities, splinting, functional activities, and emphasis on a long-range exercise program which the patient must continue after he leaves the hospital environment.